but thank you very much. I'm actually here because my CEO told me I had to be here, and that's, I found a job enhancement to do what they say. Uh, and the reason is uh, we have lots and lots of relationships, dozens and dozens in the world, universities and governments and, and big companies, and uh, there's no relationship we treasure more than the one we have with uh, this institution. And so I was told that I would come and say that, and I just said it so I can check that box off uh, at <laughs> the end of the year in my evaluation. But uh, Ravi really is a, a secret weapon, and I came to see what he's doing, and I met some great students today and drew a lot of energy, and the secret there is they work with real people, and then they study. Don't you think you'd study better if you knew you had to use it a few minutes later? And they work with people in the real world that if they make a mistake, something bad can happen, you know, in a hospital or an airline or, or somewhere. So I, I think this may be a model of the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. And what I'd like to do is talk about uh, the title, The New Internet, is, is not very descriptive. I'm not going to talk very much about technology. And so if you're my engineering friends and you want to talk about IPv6, I've got one slide on that uh, because you have to. It's a, a regulation in Silicon Valley, and I have that regulation slide. But I want to talk about not the technology, but what will we do with this new Internet? How will it change life? How will it change education? How will it change our health care? So let me dig in. Uh, with a little background that will allow you to interpret my biases or my stories or something that will make more sense to you if you know how I got here from California Beach as a little kid to, to uh, UCLA for way too many degrees. And then I went to, uh, after Vietnam, I went to Columbia University. Where's Lou Medvine? Oh, Lou Medvine, uh, 1983 doctoral student, Columbia University. Uh, so I haven't seen Lou in all that time, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see you. Uh, when you're a professor at Columbia, it's both possible and necessary to have another job so your own children can go to college someday because they're not paying you enough to send them. So uh, I started a consulting practice, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and found out I had a little talent in that area, and it took off, and that company uh, was sold to IBM. And I went to work at IBM uh, with, during the Lou Gerstner turnaround period, and I learned more about myself and more about big organizations and big transformations than you can imagine. Best graduate school in the world. And uh, so I had been big university, little company big, and then I went to Segway, which you may know Dean Kamen, the famous Dean Kamen. He's going to show up in this story uh, two or three more times uh, accidentally. This is the inverse pendulum. How many, uh, how many physicists do I have? Anybody here know what the rever you know, Never mind. It doesn't matter. But basically, this is a robot that stands underneath you, and uh, 100 times a second, it measures your, your center of balance. It stays under you is what it amounts to. It uh, turns out mall cops and uh, soldiers in Afghanistan are the two biggest users of this, and uh, they have different tires and all. Uh, and uh, the problem with it is an engineering project. It is so over-engineered to medical degree standards that the parts are about $3,700. It was supposed to sell for $1,800, so twice as many parts as the retail price. I don't know. The business school is here. We can explain it to you. That is not good. It's, in fact, it's bad when uh, your COGS are 100% more than your retail target price. And so it's been very constrained. But as a science project, it's a really interesting piece of work. And I had a lot of fun there. Uh, and then I went to Cisco. I sold uh, three years uh, to the CEO. And this is the uh, end of my eighth year. I'm trying to retire. But my wife doesn't want me to come home during the day. And my boss doesn't want me to leave. And so they've agreed that I will keep working. And that's a true story. That's not some fiction. Uh, so. I love my job, and I love my job because I get to work with some of the biggest governments and the biggest companies in the world, and I get to help them accelerate their success by showing them how technology might change their world. I'm going to show you some examples, and I don't charge a fee the way you do in consulting because we're there as a gift to try to accelerate the customer's success so that the customer will remember that and prefer our brand when it's time to you know, spend four or five hundred million dollars. So first part I want to uh, assert is that technology matters. And I only have time for one chart on why technology matters. And it's the history of the world population for the last 10,000 years. And they actually know what the population was and would be. And it would be about 1 billion people today if organic growth alone had uh, been the thing that drove uh, our, our growth, population growth. 11% of all of the people who have ever lived on the face of the earth are alive right now. 
One out of nine people that's ever lived is alive right now. But what happened here is we're going, and by the way, about 1.15% of all the people that have ever lived have been killed in violent conflict. And uh, I'll give you those references if for some reason you save references. Uh, this is the line you'd expect. This is what in fact happened. Something around 1770 changed the whole direction of that curve. And then again, after World War II, we're now in the fifth of the industrial revolutions, the information age, and it should last, if it's typical of the previous four, to about the year 2025 to 2030. Some people, like Carlotta Perez, believe it's gonna go on longer because this is the first industrial revolution that's actually covered the world. And then either nanotechnology or biotech will replace uh, information technology. The number of people on the face of the earth is the best example of why technology matters. And so my whole life is aimed at increasing productivity because that's the fuel of human progress. And that, is me that means creating more value with less time and with fewer resources. That is what my life is about. Well, I want to give you uh, just a tiny little bit of vocabulary in here. Some of you already know it. Uh, placate me for just a second. If you don't understand what happened while you were uh, going to work every day, you're not going to enjoy what's going to happen next. And that's the digital revolution. Now, the only part I want to focus on is content has escaped the containers. So there is this thing about 13 inches wide made out of plastic, vinyl plastic, and you'd hold it, had grooves in it. I'm trying to explain what a record is to those who've never seen one. You put it on a special machine and it goes around at, at a certain known number of revolutions, drags a needle through the, the uh, grooves. If they're wide, it's a low note. If they're uh, thin, it's a high note, and it basically is amplified, and that's this wonderful thing called recorded music, which we all love. But you want to play that music, you had to have that. I'd have to give that to you, and you'd have to take it somewhere. And they made it mobile uh, after a while, and Nakamichi in Japan uh, basically put it on little tapes, quarter inch, and the secret there, uh, still analog, but the secret was he took the hiss out of it in the, uh, the circuitry. And then along came people who took the analog signals, and on your iPods and things, they're only doing it 128K uh, per second, I believe. It's very poor sampling compared to a CD. But they took the note where it is, and they turned it into a set of numbers, zeros and ones, because computers work in on and off, basically. And the patterns represent a note, a color on a screen, whatever you want it to be. And when you digitize it, it escapes the container, snaps it, and allows it to go anywhere. So now you can play it on your computer. You can uh, send it to friends on your computer. And I used a GPS to find you today, and that was a great, thrilling experience. Uh, but that same GPS will play music and, uh, and has pictures of my family so that we remember uh, what we vaguely look like when we're, I'm on the road about 80% of the time. I don't use that except as a GPS anymore because everybody has a smartphone that will do the music and all those other things. The point is convergence. As soon as you get digital, digitization, the whole world changes, and I'll show you why. Now people want any content or application on any device, anytime, anywhere, securely, and they want to be able to communicate with anyone. A lot of people in the industry, like Cox, would call that the connected life. That's what they're selling, a connected life. Now I'm going to ask you uh, to make a choice here. If you could only have one of these two things in your life, only one, would you prefer indoor, convenient, comfortable sanitation? Or would you prefer a smartphone? How many people would prefer they have to have their sanitation first? OK. Hello, America. <laughs> no, that's the answer I usually get in the United States. What do you think the numbers are? Here's what the survey said. There are 4.3 billion toilets in the world. There's 5.3 billion phones in active use in the world, and there are 6.7 billion people in the world. People faced with a choice would much prefer communications. We're, we've got a village in India that we're trying to take into the leading part of the 21st century, and it's teaching us much more than we're, we're giving them. But a lady uh, was held up as an example to me. She had a feverish child that she's very worried about. She walked two days to the regional uh, health center. And you say, two days? to the regional health center is probably only 15 kilometers away, but carrying a child and food you had to have and stopping along the way, she made the 15 kilometers. And she got there with her child she was very worried about, and the doctor or the, the healthcare person had gone, wouldn't be back 
for another 10 days, a circuit rider. And so she walked two more days home, four days, and didn't solve the problem. Would she rather have your fancy toilet or a phone? She could call ahead and find out. That's what you need to understand. This is changing the whole world at the most personal, deepest, intimate level. And I want to talk about that. America, about four out of five people are now on the internet. In the world, it's about one, uh, about 30%, roughly one out of three. But, and yes, North America, where it started, is still uh, the largest penetration rate, but the largest number of users are in Asia. And that rate is going to increase at a very, very rapid rate. The internet is the fastest spreading technology in the history of the entire world. Seven years from zero on the internet, 95, it existed, but it wasn't web at the time, to 50% of the American population. It took 100 years for the printed daily newspaper to reach 50% population, and now it's going down. So this is an incredible technology. But we think of people on the internet. In fact, people won't be the dominant inhabitants of this new internet. It will be smart objects, uh, and these are things that can sense and measure anything, light, motion, chemicals. And then uh, there's a little processor that applies some rules like, if you see this, then do that. If there's radiation in the air, then send this signal. And uh, the essential part is the communications over here. So let me give you an example. Uh, most of you have a badge that's a near field badge. You, you go to work and you go somewhere near the door, or I wear uh, a device to measure my activity and my weight. And uh, it, uh, if I go within nine feet of an RFID, uh, excuse me, a, a Wi-Fi device, it sends my current uh, activity. Uh, it, my wife and I follow each other on our, our phones. Uh, she's much more interested in where I am than I am in where she is. I don't know why, but... Uh, but I'm always in the right place, uh, according to my phone. Uh, I did not go to school, just eat my lunch. You know, I can, I can program. But no, the point is we can follow each other, and you can do that too, anybody that's got a, a device. But there are about 50 billion of these tags in the world called radio frequency ID, and they're either active, meaning they're sending out a signal all the time. They cost about $25. Why would you want one of those? Well, there are 58,000 respirators in the United States hospitals, and you say, I don't care. Well, you cared a lot during the SARS scare. You cared a lot because 58,000 would not be close to enough to take care of an epidemic in the United States. But you know what? An audit found during that period, half of them were missing. Half of them were not where they were supposed to be. They were somewhere in the hospital, but not where they were supposed to be. A $25 uh, active RFID tag would have revealed where they are. But this is a passive one that you uh, basically apply some uh, electricity to, like a barcode, it carries information. And then you have these, these very smart, we call them moats, but it, it's a complete computer sensing and communication system. Do you see how small it is relative to a penny? So they can go anywhere. Now we're running out of IP ad uh, internet protocol addresses. And uh, the protocol we're on right now is version four. There is no version five. It was an experimental version used for mobile. You'll never worry about it. But IPv6 is the answer, the military uses it now, to having enough addresses. Well, how many addresses will you have? Each of you will have 57 trillion addresses on the internet that could be associated with you. And you say, why would I need this many addresses? My friends, within probably 10 years, eight to 10 years, every time you buy a can of soda, every time you buy anything, it will have an internet address. And you won't pay a charge. You, well, you'll pay a charge when you take your soda can out, and when you properly dispose of it, your bank account will get your 10 cents back automatically without taking anything anywhere. You, but that's just a trivial example. They will be so available that we will be able to measure the presence and the needs of many, many different people and places. Now here's just, bear with me, two, three real quick technical points. And they're not really technical, but I want to go to the ideas. Classically, since the 1950s, we've talked about the stack. You have the network infrastructure, you have storage, you have server or, or the computer, some people call it middleware, operating system, and then the application. You have that on your desk, you have it in the phone you use, you have it on your iPad. That stack has lasted for 50 years. The problem with the stack is that you don't use all of those parts a lot. So Amazon sells about 70% of everything it's going to sell in a year 
in 80 days. But they have to have a computer system that can handle those 80 days perfectly or they lose the sales. So they have this huge extra capacity, which they will gladly sell to you as a network service. So if your server is only used about a fourth of the time, except during surges, here's another way of doing it. You write a little bit of software, and this is the cloud idea, virtualize it. You say, you know, I am going to take all the servers in your company, and I'm going to treat them as if they're one server, and I'm going to allocate your problem across, you know, half your data may be in Raleigh, and half your data may be in Jamaica, and you don't care and you don't know, because when you need it, it all comes together. That's the idea of the cloud. And so by virtualizing these devices, we basically have cheaper computing in more places, faster, less power required. 2% of all the power in the US is consumed by IT. Uh, less cooling requirement, less real estate required, less labor. And that means what? You'll have more computing in more places. This is a drawing uh, that we call the cloud. And that's because all engineers, when they get to the details, they just say, well, never mind. It's in here, right? You draw a white thing. And if you really want to know, you can look in there, but nobody ever wants to look in there. In the early days, you had your stack inside your premises, and then you learned to uh, have the stack at somebody else's premises, like a Google or an Amazon, and now this cloud is going to become the dominant way of computing. And that means you don't have to have a PC. You can have a little tablet. You can have a phone. You can have a digital screen on a wall. What's it mean? What's going to happen? Well, let's look at books. You have a beautiful library here. Bill Gates uh, was at the Clinton Global Initiative, and I was there. We're working together on something. He's buying a billion dollars worth of books. And he said, do you think I shouldn't buy a billion dollars worth of books? I ought to buy e-devices or, or something else besides books. I don't want to be the guy who bought the last billion dollars worth of books but I don't trust the new electronic world to take care of people out in remote areas that I'm trying to buy books for. What do you think we ought to do? We had a great conversation, and I said, I don't know. We're, in that, we're on the cusp of that change. This is a 580-year-old technology, actually invented by the Chinese, movable type, but in the West we think of it as Gutenberg, and it had a lot to do with religion. The spread of Protestantism was largely fueled by cheap Bibles or cheap word of God being available to people to break a relationship between uh, you, your priest, organization, and God, you now could go directly because you understood. And literacy went way up. Lots and lots of political uh, causes as a result of this innovation. For 580 years, it's been somebody kills trees, boils them for the cellulose, makes paper, somebody makes a printing press, somebody writes something worth printing, somebody makes marks on paper, somebody binds it in a book, somebody takes it. Well, let's go look. Somebody takes it to a distributor warehouse. Somebody then takes it out of the warehouse, puts it on a retailer shelf, hopes somebody comes and buys it. 23% of all the books printed in the United States last year will be remaindered, meaning they will be sent back to the publisher who puts a cut in the corner. You may be the guy like me that buys them. And they're sold at flea markets and things like that. But they're not successful. And then somebody reads it. The new model is somebody writes it. The publisher does their thing. It goes on a server, actually many servers, in a data center that replaces all the people who made paper and drive the paper and, uh, and the printing presses. It costs six cents to download any book in the world to your Kindle or your iPod. Six cents replace that whole value stream up there. Okay. Now, if you make books, you know this story. Borders just went bankrupt. Barnes & Noble's, one of my favorite, is on the cusp of going bankrupt. We think that within a nine-year period, we'll go from mainly books and a few E to almost all E, and books will be saved for ceremonial occasions, for presentations and things. Last year at Christmas, Amazon sold more e-books than paperbacks. No, excuse me, hardbound. And they believe they will sell more than paperbacks sometime in the next 30 or 40 days and paperbacks are the largest selling form of the printed word in the world. So nine years may not be an exaggeration. You're living through it. Cox is here, and, and one of our customers, and, and one that is in one of the most intensely modern battles on the face of the earth for this new internet. 
So along comes cable TV and, and uh, jumps over broadcast because of quality and variety and more channels. And they could charge, I, I made it up, $33. I call this triple play. And by the way, because it's all digital, you can run the phone line, a voice or movie. I don't care what it is. Movies are harder than voice. Voice is easy because you don't have the same quality of uh, assurance required. And then internet access. Well, along comes this, uh, this phone, cell phone, and uh, of those people who are, let me get it right, under 30 years old right now, 27% have no landline already. It's just going straight up. They say, well, why would I want it? I'm never near it, right? And so that cutting the cord took out some money. Uh, and along comes uh, Hulu, and uh, you can watch TV anytime you want, and takes out another part of it. So here's today's Wall Street Journal. Second section, story, YouTube. YouTube, you know what YouTube is, right? The little clips. How much do you pay for YouTube? This is going to be a recurring theme. <laughs> Actually, it costs money. So why are they giving this to you? Why is Google spending all this money? It's advertising. They're renting your eyeballs. They're attracting your eyeballs. How many minutes out of broadcast television and prime time are devoted to advertising out of every 60 minutes? It's now 27 minutes, up from 23. You know why it went up? Because they're losing viewers, and they're trying to hold the same amount of revenue, so they have to charge more. And now TV may be coming back. Well, you know what today's news is? Google has invented this thing called a channel where you can watch the kinds of things you want to watch. So if you like a certain style of music, instead of goofing around looking for it, it's all on a channel. Channel, have I heard that word before? Oh. That would be cable TV that organizes it for you, right? This is what we call over the top. What do they pay you when they go over the top? Not enough. Not enough. And so you know what the other chapter of this story is? It's going to come out in another week. The people who make the content are going to disintermediate all the people who deliver it and bid one against another. How do you know that, Gary? Because they're doing it. They're starting to do it. And then you have Netflix in there, streaming. This is a battle that you may not even be aware of, that whole companies, successful companies, are either going to win or they're going to lose. But they can't both win. And that's what makes this such a poignant story, a poignant era we're in. By the way, we're very well aligned in what we're hoping happens to add more and more services uh, around this to make it more valuable. So let me give you some examples. This is a, a new Coca-Cola machine. It's called Freestyle. Have any of you read about it or, or heard about it? You know what it is? Uh, this machine uh, makes, actually can make 300 different drinks, but they limit it to about 100, I think 103. And you go up to this panel and you, uh, you can say, well, I, I want water. OK, what do you want in your water? I want, a little, I want a snazzy little bit of root beer, and I'll take a little bit of lemon, and I want some cherry. And you can make whatever you want, your own custom drink on this. Now, the reason, and of course, if you have more drinks that you like, because they think the brown cola waters are going to go away pretty, or, or go down, if you have more drinks, you'll be able to sell more. They now sell 1.2 billion containers a, or servings a day. Within the next 18 months, Coca-Cola will sell 3 billion servings a day. In a round numbers, that means one out of two people every single day, seven days a week, pays money to Coca-Cola for something somewhere in the world. And they think that's the way the world should go. And uh, this is a, a device, by the way, uh, that you need to understand how it works. It uses microdosing that was originally invented for chemotherapy. And you know who invented that microdosing device? Dean Kamen, the Segway guy and the arm guy. Same, uh, same entrepreneur inventor, uh, who, by the way, has uh, one of your, uh, your citation uh, built jets here uh, that he flies single pilot. I flew in the right hand seat uh, with my eyes closed most of the time uh, for quite a while. But here's how it works. This is a box at the back of a McDonald's or over here in the student union. And there's a cable that comes out. It has to be refrigerated, usually. Cable that comes out and goes into the gas. And then the cable goes into the front. And when you pull the handle, that box puts some syrup into the system and sends it through. And that's the way it's been for a long time. You see these cartridges over here? They're about the size of a VCR cartridge. They have concentrated the flavors at 150 times the potency 
of the stuff that's in the normal box. Okay, you're all mathematicians. Do the math real quickly. They need 1 150th of the space that they originally needed to store it. Therefore, all the refrigeration rooms in the back are reduced to something half the size of this. All the power for those rooms is removed. These cartridges are reusable and cleanable. The trucks required to deliver them, you can send those through the mail on the back of a FedEx truck. Coca-Cola has 100,000 delivery trucks in the United States right now. The packaging that can't be reused on the old method, totally replaced. In other words, the economics of the Coca-Cola company are completely changed by this innovation, which is a really clever innovation. So what can I add to that? What could I possibly do that would make it more interesting? And I'm not allowed to tell you exactly, but I can sort of point uh, to the things. What if that soda machine joined the cloud, the internet, and that when you came up to it and you hit your loyalty card on it, remember I said RFID badge, you hit your loyalty card on it, it says, hey Gary, good for you dude, you're back for your second serving today, and uh, how did you want to rate that last one on the 10 point? Sucks. It really was a mistake. That was swamp water. Oh, okay, well we're not going to go to that section anymore, aren't we? Uh, and Gary, you know, since you were here uh, earlier today, why don't you take a big instead of a small because I want to deliver to you some, some love, especially after the swamp water. And what are you going to try today? And I make up something and I pick it out and it is a number so I can come back and get it again. It's got my record. I push one button and it goes to Ravi and all my friends on Facebook so they can see what I'm using. And they can improve on it and send it back. And we can have contests. I turned the soda machine into the old-fashioned soda shop where people went, not for the drink, but for each other. You changed the economics with the technology. You changed the use of the product, the meaning of the product, made it a social product with the Internet. Are you following the story? Okay, I want you to hear two things. And I'm, I'm addressing this to those of you who are making choices in life. Bless your hearts at 18, 19, 20, 30 that range, think services as much as you think products. You're in love with the flashy products. Services will account for more value than products. Going forward. And secondly, think about how you can work with others, not just yourself, to create value. Because my story is, very few of these things come from one clever person. All of them come from collaboration. And since you were a little tiny kid, I'll take my case. And, and, you, uh, you're in the fast reading group, and you knew you were in the fast reading group. The they called them red feathers or yellow heads or something, you know, yellow hats. You knew the slow and the fast kids, right? You were in the fast reading group, and then you got into fast track at high school, and then you got into a good college with a scholarship, and then you got in graduate school, and you got to be a professor, and you got tenured, and all of, it's all about you. It's all about you. Well, it isn't anymore. You know, I don't care how smart you are if you can't work in a team and amplify the people in your team, you're probably just a, a science project oddity. So, this is a health care. You're either diseased or healthy, according to the way we do it in the, in the United States, and this is the way your life is supposed to go. In fact, that is not the way many go. Most of them get chronic diseases back in here. But our whole system is set up that if you fall into the disease, we spend money and we push you back up into the not diseased. And only 3% goes into prevention. But most of the things that we're treating actually started long before. Uh, smoking would be an example. Here, it's either your environment, which in fact is where most of the, uh, the variance is, or the things you can do, including medications. About 11% of all the money spent in healthcare is medications. There is a problem, however, and that is uh, called compliance or adherence. So I hope nobody in the room is dealing with schizophrenia right now, but about 1.5% of the entire United States is actively schizophrenic. Uh, now, and uh, roughly 3.5% will have some episodes at some point in life. Bipolar is even more common than that, and there is a pill that treats both of those. It's called Respiradone from Neil. And uh, I'm going to tell you a true story, and I have one of them here, uh, of a group we're working with in Silicon Valley, and it goes like this. It takes five weeks of taking Respiradone to get your blood chemistry stable and to lose all of the hallucinations and be able to function, not have to be supervised. If you miss four pills, that's one day, it takes five weeks to get your blood chemistry back up because it's that fragile in the way it, it uh, works. And if you take it, it has this unbelievably powerful effect. The adherence rate on Respiradone is 35%. 
because it has side effects. It has dry mouth, it has uh, the impotence and, and uh, some other problems that some people decide, you know, I'm feeling better now. I think I'll quit taking the pill because I hate the side effects and then they cycle back. So here's a, an idea. You take a pill and on top of that pill is a little computer chip and I have one right here. Why don't I, I hand it around and if you'll just remember to have me leave with it. There's a, a band-aid on the back of it is uh, basically an antenna and a little processor and you take this pill which has a little computer on it made of only organic things you eat like magnesium and zinc and your vitamins if they're next to each other and they hit your gastric acid for 12 minutes they set off an electrical signal you cycle that in other words you you basically tune it to whatever the number is on that pill and your skin for 12 minutes has that number available or that pulse available on your skin this you're wearing usually on your back down here or on your chest is picked up and sent to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to your cell phone and tells them whether or not you took the pill. And I'll pass it along to you. So what happens is if you didn't take the pill in 60 minutes, a nurse calls you and says, hey, Gary, you know, you missed a pill. Is it okay? Get your pill. Don't forget. If 120 minutes goes by, a nurse that costs $75 a trip goes and finds you and helps you take the pill. Now you say, $75? Wait a minute. Do you know what it costs to supervise somebody for five weeks to get them back? That's $75 is trivial. Not to mention the woe of being agitated and sick. This idea, which comes from a company called Proteus Biomedics, is just one of probably 100 things we have going in the lab right now. And Ravi's come out to our lab to see it. And I want to share some more with you. This is the future of healthcare that we can afford. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are keeping track, you've got a patient, a home network, an internet provider like Cox, a data center, which could be Cox in the future, that alerts a contact center, which could be Cox in the future, which uh, whatever person the patient has chosen to, to uh, notify uh, who can get there, the patient's doctor, and the contact center can go out and check on them. So that is a, a real quick schematic of all the parts that have to be in it. What the common denominator there, all those yellow lines is what? It's communications, it's the network. And that's an example of how the network changes life. This is called health presence. That's a 1080p high definition TV. And uh, the patient sits here. And uh, all of these devices are available. The doctor, a phlebotomist, which in the United States is $15 an hour, draws blood. Uh, basically keeps it clean, sits you in the chair, uh, sets you up with whatever the doctor wants and they can consult with you. It not only gives you access uh, wherever you want to be, it's much, much cheaper. The doctor can do three or four of these during a spare time. There is a very large pharmacy, very large uh, pharmacy in the United States that has clinics that will have these in the clinics. We've trained the first 14 people. This is another way that we will be able to reduce the cost of health care and give it to you in more places. We've got one of these in our office. Now I want to switch over to cars. Most people don't realize it, but 85% of all the travel on the face of the earth is an automobile. And what's amazing is most of those automobiles have one person in it. And most trips are less than 50 kilometers, which I, I don't know, 35 miles for those of you who are in the English system. And uh, there are uh, roughly 44,000 uh, plus people killed every single year in collisions in the United States alone and in some uh, areas, it's a much higher rate than that, as you probably know. And so the future, we think, will continue to be passenger cars, but we think half of these cars will not be cars that you own. They'll be cars that you share, like Zipcar would be an example. If you go to Boston or something, take a taxi into the city, go to your meetings. When you need a car to get out of the city and go somewhere, you take out your iPhone and you say, where's the nearest car that I want? And uh, you pay, uh, I think it's $7 an hour for the car, and then you leave it uh, back. This is a schematic by my, one of my French engineers, and you can see the Frenchness of it just by the color scheme. Uh, but this is a car. This car is typical of cars in the world, has seven different networks in the car you drove here today. Those seven networks are made by different manufacturers. So you have an ABS uh, to control the brakes. You have one for the engine controls. You have entertainment as a separate one. You have an accelerometer that fills the airbags with air. If you slam on the brakes, your ABS sees it 
And an entirely different network says, oh, we're going to hit something. Go ahead and fill up the airbags, right? Well, the brakes should have told them. Why didn't the brakes tell the airbags? Well, the brake one is made by one company, and the airbag one's made by another one. 35% of the cost of building a European car, electronics. US, 25%. They do more fuel efficiency. 57% of all of the warranty repairs last year in the United States, electronics. Why? Because they're made by different people. They're not integrated. There's no design philosophy across them. So here's our plan. And of course, everybody gets in the car, brings their own uh, communications. Eight times a minute, this is sending out a unique address. That's how they can find you. And therefore, we can measure traffic speed by how fast it goes by. So what we intend to do is take all of those 154 pounds of plastic and wiring in a typical American car to hold those seven networks. And we're going to take it all and replace it with a box that costs $200 that we call a Cisco Auto Platform. And basically, it converges all of the electronics in the car with triple redundancy like you'd have in an airplane. It replaces about $800 worth of, uh, of gear. But it essentially takes you out of your car. So this is a car going into snow somewhere in, in Illinois or whatever, and it begins to slide in the, in the snow. Automatically, the wheels are trying to adjust. And in this car we've built, for everybody for five kilometers behind you, you know, three and a half miles, their car automatically gets a signal. And what happens is their dashboard alert comes on, the suspension tightens down, and you basically get a much safer car based on what? The knowledge of the person who's ahead of you. Does this sound a little bit like social networking, like putting a Coke machine on Facebook? Over and over and over again, you're going to hear this theme come through. So we connect inside the car, the infrastructure outside, and to the cloud in uh, the data center. This is a true story, one of our, our clients. 210 Lexus SUV, they're very proud of it. They've had a hard time this year. And uh, Consumer Reports gave it a do not buy, unsafe. They were crushed. They took them off the markets immediately. Within 72 hours, they found out what the problem was. It was a piece of software, stability code. They rewrote the software, and then the hellish recall began. They pressed the CDs, they sent them to the dealers, they sent notes that alarmed people, they were getting bad press, they taught people how to load it. If they had had that automotive platform device I talked about, they could have downloaded that repair in one hour to every single car in the fleet. And in hour two, they could have tested it to make sure that it was working properly. Nobody alarmed, nobody hurt, no expense. You follow the story of the new internet? What most of you may not realize is that most car manufacturers only make about 1% uh, on selling you a car. But you buy 22% of what you paid for the car in financing and in roadside assistance. And I think I pay $10 a month for all of the XM radios and all. So it turns out 82% or of the money you spend is for the device, but only 31% of the profit. This is where the auto industry will make its money. And I know you think I'm crazy. And we work with all of the big manufacturers. I can imagine a day when certain sort of middle range cars are free. You have to pay insurance, obviously. But they're free to you if you will buy the services. Now you say, I, that, that can't happen, Gary. In your pocket, you have a telephone, which a manufacturer paid a little over 55% of the cost, and they get a discount, so it's more in your terms, 55% of the cost of this because you did what? You agreed to give two years of service, right? Can you imagine that the car could be on that same model? I can. That's what he was talking about. So let's talk about innovation. That's what this is all about. That's what a university is about. That's what each of us tries to create in ourselves each day. It's a big topic, 94 million hits in English for innovation. It's a very important topic. But most people don't understand that there are three stages to, to innovation. The first is the invention stage. Americans in particular love innovators. We love our Dean Caymans. We love our Thomas Edison's. We love those stories of Henry Ford. The one person against the world in ignorance who got rich, right, made it. By the way, Henry Ford went bankrupt twice. We have more ideas than we can apply. The second job is the one that's 
never taught in colleges, is the most important one to develop in America today. That's the person who scans, who plays with gadgets and thinks and is creative. What if you, what if you took a chemotherapy insulin pump and you put it on a Coke machine and you could, mm -hmm. That adoption stage, not the invention stage, is the one that we're shortest on. And once you adopt, well, here's a story. Uh, you know, Xerox invented every single thing in the modern personal computer. Steve Jobs saw it there at Palo Alto Research Park, and he put most of it into the Mac in 1985. Well, why didn't Xerox do it? Answer, Xerox officials were on the East Coast. These wackos were on the West Coast and didn't have people who knew how to talk about the business side of their technology, and they lost. That, by the way, is the stock of Apple, Xerox. Let's do it again. Apple, Xerox. Okay. Execute. And we have all these techniques like, five, like Six Sigma and all these things we know how to do in execution. Most companies are very good at this. You can hire a lot of this in very creative universities and places. So I'm going to ask the audience. I'm going to ask you to look inside yourself. Every one of us has a natural, easier to, to do tendency around one of these three. I'm going to ask you, are you an inventor? Are you an adoption specialist? Are you an execution specialist? How many inventors do I have in the room, please? OK, I've got about 10. How many adoption specialists do I have? I've got about an equal number. How many execution, getting it done, making it work, do I have in the room? Okay. That is my problem. I did this at a very famous company that is number one in its category, and I'll just leave it out of it. And I had the 300 top people in the company. Four were self-diagnosed in inventors. Six out of 300, for a total of 10, were on the adoption invention stage. All the rest were execution. And the CEO, as I came off the stage, he looked at me and said, that was worth the whole talk, just figuring out that I didn't cover all of the bases of innovation. You know why? The people who do this don't like the people who do this. <laughs> the people who do this think these people were potty trained incorrectly and are way too tight. And uh, why do meetings have to start on time? You know, they don't. In the world down there, in the world up here, they don't like each other. So creative groups are learning how to put them together. And P&G, we work a lot with P&G, they broke this problem by there is never a time you have only an inventor, only an adopter, or only execution. These groups go down and watch and participate as innovators so that when it comes to here, they already have a friend who can explain it to the next group. And that's the way they broke it. Look at the way you educate people. What part of that is your curriculum sponsoring? I say this is the only thing that is missing in reviving the United States' ability to innovate. So most failures of innovation are really failures of collaboration. This is a story of Sony, one of my clients. They invented in 1979, if you're old enough, you probably remember this, you could take your music with you. Unbelievable. You could block out all the people and even some of the smells on the subway in New York, listen to your own music. It was an unbelievable thing, right? And then when the media changed storage, they went to the disc, and then they went to solid state. They invented, named, and owned mobile music. So much so that in 2001, when this story begins, they had a Walkman division, they had a computer division, they owned their own content music, they had electronics, they had their own software in something called uh, Sony Connect. And in fact, uh, they were number one in batteries in the world. Apple had nothing. They had the Mac, right? You can't carry the Mac with your music around. They had nothing. And they went through Silicon Valley, and between January and October, in eight months, they bought the pieces. In fact, they got sued by Creative because they infringed a patent. But they created the first iPod back here. And this is Sony. And this is the little tiny David showing up with one rock and a slingshot. But the real story is iTunes gave them a services annuity stream so that after everybody in the world owns one or more iPods, there'll still be a reason to deal with Apple. Then what did they do? 
they added a phone to it, and I'm going to show you that statistic. And then they came out with a whole new category called iPad, which is a different form factor. Then they came out with applications. This is last year's entire, uh, or the, the quarters, through uh, second quarter of 2010. The yellow represents all of the money spent, for all reasons, on cell phones. 4% of all the cell phones in the world, the total world, were made by Apple. 50% of all the profit extracted from the industry in the entire world were Apple. Do you understand the power of innovation? Do you want to hear the insult of insults? Sony had every single part, but the divisions owned the parts and wouldn't cooperate. The batteries, the lithium ion batteries in the Apple products are from Sony. So I want to talk about close with collaboration. Henry Ford, what did he invent? No, not the car. He went to the stockyards and he watched them disassembling cows. And what was the new invention there? These electric motors that could run belts. They could generate electricity that made a reliable movement. He reversed it. He put stuff on and it was called a car when it got to the other end. So instead of a worker doing what they did in the old days, getting a tire, walking back over, and putting it on, or maybe going to the shed to get a tire and then getting the tools and then going to the next car and do it, he said, stay where you are, I'll bring you the car, and I'll bring you the, the thing you need to do. And so they could make five times as many cars per person. So he had a lot of money. He doubled the pay, $5 a day. And that was the beginning of the industrial middle class in the United States. He did not invent the car. He invented a process. Science. 20 million science papers over 50 years analyzed. And they found that today, it's teams that produce the highest quality science, the most referenced science. And the reason is, you can have more specialists and you can tie them together over longer distances with communication. So I want to show you the five things that collaboration technology can do. Help you find people or experts. Find that missing wheelchair. Connect to them for telepresence, for instance. Share quickly, back and forth information. Act, and when you act, it creates data which keeps that virtuous circle going. And all of those little pieces, you know, like we've been texting back and forth for the whole time I've been here, and it's faster than email and, and phones and all. All of those things you know are going to be swept up into one set of, of pieces of software, IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, and uh, we call ours Quad. But all of those functions will disappear into your everyday life. So the last story is, do I care? Do I care if my kid can talk to more uh, people uh, faster? And uh, create more havoc, well, or do more business. This is GE. During April 2008, nadir of the recession, Jeff Immelt, CEO of GE, talking about his business, he said, Gary, there are 1,000 airplanes not flying with GE engines because there's nobody, passengers. They're sitting in the desert. There's 740 locomotives on sidings in the United States alone because there isn't enough cargo. And you say, Gary, how do I know that? Because I have a report right here where every one of those suckers is right now. There's 740 parked. We are number one in wind turbines. But the problem is uh, they're not really competitive until oil is at $138 a barrel. Oil today is at $73.10. So I've got a little ways to wait to get my money there. But there's one area that there's this huge demand in, and we can't meet it. It's for ultrasound imaging devices in China and India, and they'll pay. My cheapest one is $110,000. They only want to pay $15,000. It has to be portable so they can carry it around. I can't make it. I can't fly my engineers from the United States to China and, and house them there to build this. I can't get enough people in China to build this. I can't bring them here. It's just not economically feasible. We said we'll be back in one week. And what we did was build this room, raised up telepresence so when you walk around, you're always on camera. This is a smart board over here. Your video is over here being shown. These are uh, chairs by steel case. Uh, and whatever person is talking is automatically uh, on screen. We can translate automatically between, say, English and Chinese. Uh, at the end of the meeting, if you're a WebEx user, you push one button, you get a transcript. That means that you have a record, but the main reason is you can search uh, to find particular. When did we disagree on the size of that? When did they make that offer? Well, you can go right to the video and then rewatch that video. This particular, they call it virtual collaboration space, has cut their innovation time in more than half. 
Now, let me say that a different way for you. There's been a 100% increase in the throughput of innovation at GE. They are now building a factory for knowledge workers, just like Henry Ford built a worker uh, manufacturing line in what was the Visteon Parts Building in Michigan, a car company that went bankrupt, being converted to a knowledge workers industrial factory. When I was in graduate school, we were all looking for the seat of intelligence. We thought it was one place. Modern imaging teaches us it's actually spread across many, many different stations. It's not one place. It's many, many different places. This is an MRI of an engineer in an MRI device solving a problem. And where you see yellow and red is where energy is being consumed. My punchline here is you may be the smartest station in the brain. You may be the smartest person in the team. But it's the connections among distributed intelligence that adds up to the innovation that we're after. So I ask you, so what? There's no slide behind this. And there's no slide behind this because you have to write in your life the conclusion. What does it mean to you? I'm pretty excited. I think the company I come from is pretty excited. Even though we're going through some, some grown-up uh, trials and tribulations you're going to read about as we try to get ready for the next 25 years. But we're excited because we think it's going to improve human life. It's going to create value. And that's what I want to work on. What's it mean to you? Thank you for your time. I find it interesting from the company you come from that you have a bachelor's degree in economics, a master's degree in psychology, and a PhD in psychology. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard your program here, your presentation. Would you uh, pull them all together? Right. You're in a... Yeah. Um, institution when I, that, uh, is, that is training people, your degrees, your presentation, how do they all work together? I, uh, this college came from uh, the idea that people who couldn't afford to send their kids away to college needed education too, and I love that about this college. I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in a, in a pretty good town, but parents went to college at night to a better us and all, and when I got to college, I had a National Defense Education Act. And they gave me a piece of paper this long and said, if the government's paying for your, your education, you must select your degree from this list. The first one I recognized was economics after animal husbandry. <laughs> and uh, so I did well in economics because of math and uh, didn't really love it. And I fell in love with psychology. And it's the same math. It's the same modeling of behavior. Uh, and uh, that has led me to the career I'm in now. The people I work with at Cisco are an odd little group. Half of them are out of McKinsey and Bain and Boston Consulting Group and very international. Four languages is the average of our group speaking, and, and I draw the average down with, with my three. But uh, one of the people who works for me speaks nine languages at diplomatic level and has been tested by the, the British government. So, uh, and uh, most of us have PhDs, 78% have business degrees. Uh, and I'm counting even the executive assistants, everybody. So we're a different kind of group. And we're drawn to each other because we don't charge for what we do. I am rewarded when a customer says, you know what, you showed me a new way I could make money with managed services by having health care at home, which is going to be a big area. You're in all these homes already. You've already wired them. You might as well just pull in a little data from the scales and the blood tests and all and add a new service. That's the kind of thing we'd do. So I'm not a regular Cisco uh, you know, a person, I come from this, this little group. Um, I think what I do will be much more common in the future than the actual bending of metal and putting things together because machines will do a lot of that, inferential machines will do a lot of it, and that adoption stage is what I'm all about. I, I know enough engineering, I know enough economics, I know enough business that I can say, this is an idea that will change the world. Let's work on it. Tin cup for money. Find the engineers who will make it their extra job. Prove that it works. Like that health presence, that came from a one drawing from one of the people that works for me. And somebody said, if you made it, I'd probably buy it. I said, we're going to make it. We did in a garage, literally in a Silicon Valley garage. That now will be in drugstores that you know within probably a year uh, and will change the cost of health care. So that's 
what I'm all about, that's how it's all wrapped up. And I don't think it's so important what your degree is. It's that you learn to learn and you're passionate about learning and you care about changing the world. Which sounds grandiose, doesn't it? My CEO's motto that I have to live by is Cisco changes the way we work, live, play, and learn. And I didn't believe that when I went to work there, but I do now. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh. Um, Rodney Miller, I'm in the College of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. The 2,000 pound gorilla, gorilla in the room is government. Mm -hmm. How does what you just presented to us, how does that impact government in terms of input, and how does government impact yeah. what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. the input and the yeah. output? And of course, there's a, there's a classic debate going on about what should be the role of government. You know, when you're in a recession and you're dying, all of a sudden government seems pretty cool. <laughs> and then when you have to pay for it, it doesn't seem so cool anymore. So this political debate's going on, but uh, think about it. Government is, by definition, a monopoly. They reserve certain things to themselves for the benefit of all of us. Any monopoly tends to be inefficient because why should I be efficient? I'm the only one. Who am I compete with? In my business, there may be somebody like you, one of you sitting in this room, in six, seven, eight years could eat my business. And if you say, I don't believe that's true, well, the company I came from was a man and wife who worked at Stanford University, got five of their friends, cleaned out their house and their garage, and they ate the world in four years. Okay, so I know how this works. When you have a monopoly, you don't have the same set of pressures. We protect it. But they are slowly, because of the pension load that they have to carry, looking for efficiency, and we're all renegotiating, can we be more productive? This isn't funny at all, but if you're my age, by the way, I'm past retirement. I told you I'm not allowed to go home. My generation, there were 4.1 of us to support each of the pensioners. So I, I was growing. My economy has been good to me since I got out of college. They could tax me a little more for that. Four of us shared it. How many of you are under 50? Okay. 2.1 for you. Because people who are going to retire, they didn't save enough. They couldn't save enough. They didn't save enough. So when you go home at night, if you're under 50, and you're talking to your partner, there's an invisible person sitting at your table eating an invisible dinner. And they're living down the hall with an invisible heater and an invisible bedroom. And they have an invisible car because you're splitting 50% of the cost of a pensioner beginning in about seven years. Right? That's when the, the full baby boom is in. Right. OK, so what do we tell them to do? 27% cut in their benefits, I don't know. We're pretty proud that we pulled a lot of people out of poverty, 60s. 27% cut in, uh, in uh, their benefits, a giant cut in their health care. Taxes go up or raise the productivity of the two people who are supporting that other one. I want to start with that. If each of you could do a third more in productivity than you do today, you wouldn't feel any pain from that group you have to support. You can't do a third, you're going to feel it. You're, you're not going to have the car you wanted. You're not going to have the trips you wanted. You're not going to have the education you wanted. So how do we raise government at least a third? I showed you health presence. I showed you ways. We're working with lots of government agencies where you can work at home. You may be disabled. Right now, I'm sending somebody disabled a check just to survive. What if I put them through training, got a job that they could, could do from home on their pace, and converted a beneficiary to a worker delivering government service to maybe somebody like themselves? You've seen the theme I'm trying to build here? Now, we don't do that until we have to. Unions don't want to do it. I wouldn't either if I were one. Well, I'm telling you we have to. It's here. It's not a question per se. I compliment you on your speaking. I compliment you on your program. I compliment you on your company. What I suggest is that you and your company make programs for PBS to let the people in general have this knowledge. Yeah. That, uh, thank you very kindly. It you know, means a lot to me when you get feedback. Like, it's what makes you want to try harder. Um, we spend quite a bit on trying to communicate this message and do it. 
So and it may seem odd to you, around the United States and around the world, Sichuan, the earthquake, I happened to be in, in Shanghai when it happened. Uh, my CEO was the first American CEO to land in China and said, we're going to give $45 million to build the hospitals, but we're not going to build a single building. We're going to build what hospitals do. And so we connected these rural hospitals with the regional hospitals, with the big hospitals, with Johns Hopkins. I got a call on, uh, and I was very proud that, it, that we had done that for nothing. You know, I mean, we didn't ex expect to sell anything. I got a call one Saturday from somebody I'd met there. He said, Gary, uh, now that we have stabilized, all these people were amputated, and, and a lot of them were kids. And you know why they were amputated? The building's pancaked. The building's pancaked because the rebar that should have been in the buildings to hold them up had been corruptly sold to, by government officials in some cases to private enterprise, which is growing fast there. So my, I get angry when I see children that had to have a limb cut off to save their life. But I got this call on Saturday morning, and he said, Gary, now we have a new problem, and you might be able to point us in the right direction. We have 10,000 amputees and no prosthetics industry. Nobody knows how to do that. Is there anybody who could help us learn how to make an arm or to make a leg? And so I connected with some universities, and I felt privileged to do that. At the same time, I worry about competing in the future with China. I'm very mixed about how we're going to get good at being better, not them getting worse at what they want to do. You know, that isn't going to work. Can't count on that. So the answer to your question is we don't do it as effectively as we should, but our heart is where you're asking us to go. We don't resist it. And thank you again sincerely for the time you gave me. I really appreciate it.